It's no secret that we love our Arabian horses and those that have come into our lives as a result. From the everyday amateur to the professional trainer, AHT Talks is here to chat about the latest happenings, get to know some of our favorite individuals, and answer some of the questions we're all eager to know. Now, here's our host, Laura Ames. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to have Julie Daniels with us this afternoon to discuss uh, her her involvement in the Arabian horse industry. And uh, from what I can tell from an outsider looking in, she's put an amazing lesson program together. And I think uh, that's something that other farms in our industry probably you know, she could be the model for some of us to follow in how to put a lesson program together. Um, but before we get into that, I want to just thank our sponsors today for allowing this to happen. Jarvis Insurance, Oak Ridge Arabians, Radon Arabians, Conway Arabians, and Cedar Ridge Arabians. Hi, Julie. How are you today? I'm great. How are you guys? Good. How's the COVID times treating you? It's not been the worst for us. We live in a state where it's outside, great weather. We're considered outdoor recreational. So we've been able to keep going a little bit. Yeah. Uh, things are definitely getting better now. Well, that's, that's great. Julie, why don't you start out telling us, how did you get involved with horses and particularly Arabian horses? So my mom was into horses from the get-go. My dad bought her a horse when they got married in their 20s, and she got into the Arabian horses. She trained a little bit, not much, but trained at a small level and had a kid program like myself. And I've just was riding since like I was in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> now, you originally started in Michigan um, and you made your move to Arizona. You want to discuss your days in Michigan and then what brought you to Arizona? I, I did. I had a great business in Michigan um, around 2005 or so. 2004, the economy had a pretty big bust and a lot of automotive people lost their jobs and it was a little bit of a struggle. And so we had a client from Utah that actually talked us into moving to Utah. I moved in Utah in 2004, 2005. And then we moved to Arizona in 2014, I think. Um, <clears throat> and then we just kind of just needed somewhere different to go. I, I love Utah. It's beautiful there. But I think that Scottsdale is the hub for the Arabian horses. Lots of kids here. The programs have been great out here. So that's how we got out here. My sister's lived out here for a really long time. Yeah, um, I've always loved it. I've been coming to the Scottsdale show since I can remember, like in the 2000s for sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your lesson program, because like I said, to begin with, Obviously, you were, I think, what, the last two years you've been voted Instructor of the Year? I was. I appreciate all the votes, yes. <laughs> but I think you really work your lesson program, and that's probably, I don't, I could be wrong, but that's the base of your business is it's centered around the lesson program. Um, maybe share with us, like, your typical day, like, just share with us how the lesson program, how you maybe orchestrate it. Um, yeah, for sure. So I started a lesson program. I've always had a vision of a lesson program. I followed a lot of saddlebred people in Michigan and they always have huge lesson programs and they do keep their business going because of it. So I've always, I had a program in Michigan, did not have quite a big a program in Utah. Um, here it's been great. We started it, like I said, in about 2015. Um, I hired on um, an instructor that has had history in teaching and training and we have just built a, a platform and we started, you know, had a vision of what we wanted to do. So I do camps, I do tournaments, academy. Um, we just started getting into that more and more. I have a um, program that's called the Equine Achievement Program. And basically the kids that have kind of started in the lessons are moving up a little bit farther, maybe want to come out and be at the barn all the time. They sign up for that program. They help the younger kids in camp and they help kids that are younger in age, like brand new kids. We use them as spotters in our lesson program. So then they earn points and um, we call them carrots. And when they earn so many, they get free rides. So we just kind of keep building our program that way. <clears throat> and it's been great. So uh, obviously I think Scottsdale is a great area um, mm -hmm. to do lessons because obviously probably 
people can, there's probably more people in the area that can afford to do it. Horses sure. seem to have a strong love. How do you go about your marketing with your lesson program? So I can't thank social media enough, but I hate it at the same time. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> social media is a big thing. Um, we do, you can't just be on social media and be there as a page. You have to actively be working it as any biz, big business does with social media. We're on three or four different format, formats and platforms and we constantly are doing all the things you're supposed to do to build the social media. And it is, everything comes from that. Like a hundred percent, I'd say 95%, 5% is probably referrals, but things, you know, we do promotions, we do giveaways, we do videos, the things that you see a lot of people doing now that they're stuck home because of COVID, everybody's being forced to do it, right? Maybe everybody's afraid to do it. Those are the things that you need to do. Yeah. Like for sure, our business comes from that. I do a lot of other things, I guess, too, but mostly that. Like so I will do events um, or places like I do Barrett, like remember Barrett Jackson, I sit at their table every year for our Scottsdale club and we hand out flyers all day long. Or, you know, I do a lot of print stuff that gets handed out wherever we can. We send it to schools, things like that. Yeah. So with starting your lesson program, like how many lessons do you give a week? How many lesson horses do you have? Share a little bit about that. Okay, so we, you, we started with just, you know, one lesson horse, but now we have, I think, seven lesson horses. We probably do about, uh, depends on the weather and, of course, now COVID, but we do anywhere from 50 to 70 lessons a week um, and growing. We get new customers every week. I'm struggling putting it out there. I need <laughs> another instructor. Um, that's hard to find for sure. Everybody's kind of looking for one. Um, <clears throat> if I had another instructor, which we're actually – trialing somebody right now it grows faster uh that is the biggest thing is we do the lessons between my instructor that i hired and then casey my assistant she does some of the more advanced lessons um now we're pushing into group lessons which is a great way to make more money for your business gets people used to riding a little bit differently so that's your key finding you know enough instructors but that's how many we have now so a question for you, just because I, as a kid, started in a lesson program. We have a lesson program at our farm, and I, I, I believe they're the backbone of our industry, but they're a time commitment, I feel. And when you say, like, instructor, there's a difference between an instructor and a trainer. Yep. So if you were to say, like, say I'm, say I'm going to come to your farm, how do you introduce the Arabian horse and take them through the steps to become, you know? It's definitely key to your instructor. Like having, I know this is another question, but like hiring the right instructor, anybody that's starting a program is key. That person has to be a salesman, has to be uh, people friendly, love kids no matter what. And that is the easiest best starting stepping stool. Okay. So now those people are in the program and that instructor helps sell that program forward. They yeah. have to be good with that. For that sure. is, so how do you, how do you take them? And we may just, cause we're on this topic, go yeah. off a little bit the order, but how do you take them? I think the hardest thing for people is how do you take them from, okay, we're going to spend $100 on lessons to, okay, now we're going to go buy a $5,000 horse and we're going to go yep. to a horse show. Yeah. How, how do you, tell us the steps and how you do that. So again, learning from the Saddlebred, um, they do that academy program that we're starting to try to do in the Arabians. And I can't emphasize enough for people that are doing lesson programs in the Arabians to start doing that. I created a smaller version of it within my own property. We call them tournaments. We call them silver syrup tournaments. So once a month, weather permitting, we do an in-house tournament and it's only our kids and they sign up. Each kid pays to come and they each get two classes. It's very similar to the rules and the way that they do Academy, but it's just all in-house. So then you have the parents come, the kids come and they compete. I have my own schedule for it. And they compete right amongst the other lesson kids in our program. During that time, I have 
my, what we call our show kids, we call them our performance kids. And those kids will demonstrate something from a horse show. We'll either run a class or they'll bring a costume horse out or they'll do something. I end up on the PA the whole time, just trying to educate them on what it's like to go forward. You're going to get those people that are coming and say, no, I'm not showing. It's too expensive. But if you have a stepping stone type of program, their kids are going to get hooked. And if they can do it in one way or another, they'll make it happen. Um, I'm a little bit off topic with this, but I'm going to say that we have a sponsorship program that we do. And so if there are kids that can't afford it, we put them in that program. And I have throughout the year, people call me and say, I want to sponsor a kid for a year or I want to sponsor a kid for a show. Or if I just have a little bit of money, I want to do a little sponsorship. It depends on the, the, the value. Um, we'll sponsor a kid that's in the lesson program and let them do all the tournaments. Or if they're ready to move up to Academy, they'll sponsor a year of Academy, or maybe it's just one show. And we try to make, it available for everybody of all like you know everybody that no matter what they have a budget for but the, so, the tournaments are key key the, and that is a great idea i think the tournaments the building because that's obviously a stepping stone to yep. you they start there up, then you go to a horse the they come to the tournaments with no we don't put any type of show pressure on them it is just a fun great way for them to get used to riding with other horses it's good team building what have you and you wouldn't believe the, the response from it. Like the parents are asking questions after two or three of them. The kids want to keep coming. How do we do more? Where do we go from this? Can we, can we lease a horse, et cetera? And so, and I think that's something you're good at. I think uh, if I was going to say, when I look at your program or what you do, you're really good at taking um, and finding the, maybe not the most expensive horse or maybe a horse that's had a problem and turning it into working out into your scenario. How do you go about that, Julie? It's been my, my question that everybody in this industry has asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Always. When I was a kid, we couldn't afford great horses. My mom trained, had a bunch of kids, and I got, you know, the crappy whatever we could find. Either it was sour or it was in somebody's field and nobody wanted it. That's all I rode as a kid. So I guess – as my life got going and I did this as a profession, I just found it to be part of my program. I would, I had a lot of people in Michigan that could not afford $50,000 horses. And um, so back then I give huge credit to Bill Addis started the Addis um, equine Addis program when it was like live and we could go and I could go there as a trainer, buy some horses at a decent amount of money bring them home for people and be very successful for them. And back then the horses went for a lot more money than unfortunately they kind of go with the online stuff, but they still were a lot cheaper than the market. So um, I just could find something for somebody and I just, it's always been my thing. Of course, my biggest thing with that is you have to going forward when you sell that horse to be honest, 100% honest. I have to tell whoever I'm selling that horse it's history what I think it's good for. I make sure the rider I think fits that horse now that it might be straightened out or it's happy or whatever its plan was. Because if I sell it just to anybody that wants to buy it, I didn't do my job because now the horse may revert right back to where it started it when I got it. So I just, my biggest, biggest thing when I sell horses is I'm, I'm honest as I can be from everything about them. No, you can't buy this horse <laughs> because it doesn't fit you. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, with your, okay, so on the lesson programs, let's go back to that. In your program, so is, I would, do you do stepping stones into it all? Like you start here and you start in here or yep. can somebody come and take lessons and never grow with you and just take lessons for 20 years if they wanted we to? We do have a program that they kind of go higher. So that would be the type of instructor I'm actually looking for. So I have Carrie who has been with me since the beginning. We hired her and she is amazing with your brand new people, your beginners from adults to kids. Um, once they get to a point where she feels like she's either hit like a wall maybe with them or they want to do something different, we move them to that next instructor, the intermediate type of instructor. Um, Casey, who's been with me forever, will take those. Or if I have somebody in that position, those people will then 
gear them into the next level. They ride bigger horses. Um, they will do uh, more seasoned classes in the tournaments and hopefully go to the academy program. This year, we finally built an academy program and actual, we actually have some in the program. I've been saying it for years, but we finally have some. So we went to our first academy and then, so those kids are just kind of move up to that. I don't let somebody come into the lesson program, ride for six months and say, I'm buying a horse. I, I, I want to sell a horse to them. I do, but I feel like they need to go through some steps. So they wow. need to see the academy, at least a couple of them. And then maybe even lease a horse for, even if it's a show or two. So they realize the pricing and the expense and the pressure. And then we go forward to buy them a horse. By then they're ready and they understand it. You know, so yes, we have a lot of tears. Wow. We call them levelings. We have a, I have a whole brochure on leveling. Yeah, that because I think that is the hardest process is telling somebody, okay, well now you're going to do this, and it costs this much money to keep your horse, yeah. or this much it's money cool. on the vet bills. I mean, obviously, competing with horses and owning a horse is an expensive hobby if you do it either where you keep it at home or yeah. at a farm. Um, one thing I see a lot, and I, I'm always curious how other people handle it, is let's talk the show ring, like dealing with the family. Because I always say, what event can you go, you know, I couldn't go, I could be a figure skater. And I couldn't ride or figure skate for two years and go compete at the world championships or sure. the national championships in figure skating. Mm -hmm. Yet somehow our industry has got caught up in, you do it for a very short amount of time, and then you, you want to go to the nationals, you know? And yeah, so how sure. do you, how do you deal with that with your parents and like trying to not rush the process or not having the wind taken out of their sails when they get to that spot and they're maybe not ready to be there. Or there's more seasoned riders. That are it is, it's, it is a tough process. We do a lot of educating for sure. I, from back to those kids that are in that intermediate type of group we make those kids and their parents go we're, we're fortunate to have shows right here in such a beautiful facility so we force them to go to those shows and sit in the stands with somebody of our of our team whether it's another parent that has show horses or um and instructors if they have time and kind of go through the shows a little bit with them and educate them a little bit more on the shows and then you know it is hard. It's hard if they say, okay, I'm ready to buy a horse. And you go, okay, write a check for $50,000 or you're not getting a ribbon out there. It's really hard. So we do, we just go back to the steps and try to go through it and, and then explain to them that it's going to be tough. It's, it just, it really is. It is tough. There's no, even though we have class A regional and nationals, they're all the same like level of horses there. It's not like they're beginner horses, intermediate, and then they're great. So it is kind of hard to jump right in and say, you start showing at Scottsdale because that's what our first horse show, you know, wow. is. So I try to get them to do quite a few of the other shows, the tournaments, the Academy, smaller shows I have in my area, um, small class A shows that I know that aren't the competition isn't quite as tough. Let's get your feet wet. Understand that your kid's going to cry. And your kid's going to laugh and, and, and you're going to be mad and you're going to expect things. And let's go through this first before we go to Scottsdale or we go to a nationals. We do a lot of, you know, team stuff too, so that they get to know kind of the kids that have been doing it and not doing it. And they get to know okay. that, you know, how it goes. So, and like, works. Yeah. Um, describe your typical week. So I'm always, again, curious how lesson programs lay out their whole week Monday through Saturday or Sunday, depending on what day yep. you give lessons. I'm pretty removed from it. Besides um, I like to do the tours because I like to know who the people are when they come. So I do the tours. I'm removed from it because I'm so busy with the training horses. I've kind of scaled myself back to a smaller group of horses. I don't really want 50 horses anymore. So um, I work on the horses. So Carrie, who has been amazing for us, um, will pretty much start her lessons however they fit in the day. She does the scheduling for the lesson program. And so I'll work horses. Casey and I'll do horses. Apex will run in its own arena and its own barn. I'm fortunate to have that. Um, <clears throat> I've had it where we had to combine it. And we just kind of make it work. And um, it kind of runs itself over there and Carrie is great about bringing them over and kind of 
letting them, you know, hang out and watch uh, that equine achievement program I'm talking about is great to get them used to the show barn stuff. So every day is a, it's a full-time thing here, except the weather changes things. We're done by noon now this time of year. Start with clear. <laughs> um, so again, I start Casey horses in the mornings. Apex starts over there. Um, Casey will do some Apex lessons in the afternoon. And then our, our show performance people will come. Um, we do Tuesday, Thursday nights, and Saturdays are all performance people for me. And, but Apex, again, runs all day that day in another arena. Um, unless we have a tournament, then my customers are wonderful. They will help with a tournament. We run the tournaments on a Saturday or Sunday, and that'll take up, you know, the first half of the day. So it is, it's nonstop. We just had a camp. It ended today. Thank gosh. Um, we do 10 people in a camp. They start on Wednesdays, seven o'clock in the morning, and they go to one o'clock. Um, again, we have those kids that are kind of the, in that little program that help those go work themselves all day long in the offices or we have a, we're fortunate to have a, a whole apex room here so they can do some teaching in there while we're working show horses in the other arena. About your day and to just both run separately. Yes. I'm, but it's a, I think I'm lucky that way. Um, Kelly is a great friend of mine and Kelly bud. And I recently was at her place and you know, they have an indoor arena and she has the same, very similar structure to me but theirs is running kind of the same time they're working horses in that indoor arena. So they'll kind of move different places around the, from the bullpen to when the arena, when she's doing things while her lesson program will run and then they'll move that group out and they'll work some horses. So it's harder when you are working, you know, in together, it's very hard for a trainer. Let's just go with like these big trainers that have 50 horses, Jason Crumb. He has to have an instructor. There's no way he could do it. I don't think I couldn't mentally do it. I can do some, but it's hard. You well, definitely need I think it takes a special person to do 100%. it. And you, most of the time, most of the time, I think they shouldn't be interested probably in the training. It's hard to both be a trainer yep. and maybe not the adult amateurs or the youth when they've gotten to a certain point, but the beginners it takes a special person to do the beginners and have the patience and it does. not have dreams and aspirations of becoming a trainer, but probably becoming a big time instructor you know, for sure. I, and yeah. they're hard to find all it's the young, hard, probably, great huh? riders that are out there that call me and say, I want the job. I'm like, okay, but it's not training. Like you're not, you're not going to go and work horses for me and go show in the show ring. That's, <clears throat> I don't have that position open. I need you to become a great trainer or instructor. I need you to develop a team of riders. I want you to be the fighting force for these Academy kids. You're their instructor. I want them to look up to you. And it's, it's very hard. It, no, it's, I'm sure it is hard to come by. Yeah. What advice would you give somebody that's just starting out a lesson program? I'm going to start with, we're going to go to you being Julie Daniels, the trainer, but somebody on the lesson program, what, what advice would you give to them? If they're, if they're, if they're hiring for themselves, they need to be those things I said, friendly, people oriented. They've let a lot of kids motivated. If you're hiring for your own barn, same thing. I think the instructor is your first key thing for starting a program. And then you're going to have to, if you can't do it, a lot of horse trainers are horse trainers. They're, they're not savvy on the computer or, <clears throat> or social media. Find a friend, find a kid. You can find a teenage kid that's pretty darn good at it. Give them something to do it for you. They have to, you know, I helped out Ryan Strand this year at nationals and his girls, pounded my brain every day on how to help his lesson program and build it. And it's finding that's the best way to do it is getting somebody to do it. And a lesson horse is hard to find getting a good lesson horse to start some old, I mean, old bomb proof force you need to begin with yeah. safe safety is most important. So a safe horse, enthusiastic instructor and somebody that can get your social media platform going. <sighs> Sure. Most important. One last question on that. If the lesson horses, where do you go about finding your lesson They're hard. Horses? They're hard. Um, I want to stay true to our breed. I do have a quarter horse. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But um, it is, I want to stay really true to the breed and it's really hard to find them. You know, um, you want an old, 
show horse, to be honest. You want an old, old show horse that is safe. You can crawl up, crawl down. You can turn your back and know they're not going to spook. I have an unfortunate situation. My arena sits right on dynamite. It's a big, busy road. I see cars, trucks, plastic bags. They all go by. Our horses have got to be used to it. So it's really hard. I'm always... I'm always putting it out there. I'm advertising. I need a lesson horse. I need a lesson horse. We're all looking for the unicorn. I think I've just been lucky. Um, you know, I'll have somebody call me and say, look, I have this great show horse. Um, actually, one of our best lesson horses, he would be an intermediate horse, is Spirit of Fire. Um, Alexa, five years ago, four years ago, said, look, he's retired. He's doing nothing. I have no idea if he'll be a lesson horse. I'm going to tell you that he doesn't stand still and he doesn't do this and he's been a great show horse for years as we all know um <clears throat> we gave him a try and so he's re been retired here we do use him for some shows he's a huge implement i have three horses that have been retired national champions for lessons those are the hard ones to come by but when they're ready to do it i i ask owners and trainers if those are standing in your barn they he is the happiest thing possible he still gets all the same amazing vet work and 5,000 kids pamper him all day long. It's an amazing thing to donate your horse to a program. You know, I don't own him, but I take care of him for them, you know? So that's my best uh, type of horse is the retired ones, the show ones. Yeah. You know, a lot of my horses have went into our lesson program and mm -hmm. I always get a kick out of it because we'll have a fun show. And if one of the kids gets to show one of the, show horses at the beginning of the day. Well, they got a great experience going on. But right. if you're going to show them at the end of the day, they've had it. They're usually in the line yeah, parked up absolutely. and had enough of it. Our tournaments can be scary. They can be <laughs> really scary. Like all of a sudden those, exactly, the show horse is like, oh, we're at a horse show. Yeah. And they're picking it up a little bit. But it's how they learn, right? It's how so, they get better. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Julie Daniels as the trainer, because again, I t spoke on it early. I think um, one thing you're amazing at is taking a horse that's been had a troubled past or issues and making it into something. So I'm sure you have some special horses in your past. Share with us some of your special horses. So um, I kind of, that kind of highlights that other question you asked me about my, um, what was the proudest moment? Those horses actually fall into those categories. Um, a lot of people know this horse, JM Admiral Spirit, was a handful, um, to say the least. You can ask all the yeah. that had him before me. You know, I had I bought him on an Addis auction, spent a lot of money there with a gamble, um, putting him with the right rider, figuring him out. I guess my my key to those horses is I always try to listen to the horses. I know that's like not what our normal day to day is. We teach them how to act like we want to act them to act, but I try to listen to him and I love that horse. He was like my heart horse. And all it was for me was it was an everyday challenge to figure out what made him happy and how I could get him the, through the ring and get a kid through the ring. He, after two years or so of had a different rider with him first and second rider, they got along pretty good. Um, we went to youth nationals and he was reserve champion and it was like the biggest thing for me <laughs> because for him to win that class, I mean, I about fell off and this is a really bad memory of it, but I was walking around the side of Albuquerque and he was at the top 10 and he was at the end and he was terrible at victory passes, just would leap up in the air and just would never trot. And he was a lunatic. So I was going to go down the side gate to run my 10 top 10 with him. And I was standing next to Mike Ferrara waiting for that to happen. The top 10, which he was already in um, for them to call champion reserve. And so I could do my thing and they called him reserve. And I screamed so loud in Mike's ear. I'm pretty sure I blew his drum. Uh, his drum. <laughs> so, um, that was a big one for me. I love that horse. Um, and then, um, you know, the horses that you get your first national championship one with, um, all right. Dark Hunt Strutter was a big horse for me. Beautiful. Yay Lightning yeah. Jack was a great horse for me. They, they put me on the map. Um, you know, and then going forward later on, I'd have to say, turn it up. Um, 
Robin Porter's friend of mine. I grew up with her sister. We were great friends as kids. And we were at nationals and she was like, it's going to the pasture. And I'm like, well, let me take him home. Let me go play with him. You know, they had a lot of trouble. He's very troubled in the show ring. And she's like, I'm just going to go turn him out. And I said, well, I'll take him home. I took him home from nationals and I played with him and he uh, was scared of every little thing possible. He would kind of go in the ring and turn around. His bar name became Turner. Um, and I just found the right kid in the right situation. We bought him and he went on to win three national championships for us in specialty classes. He was, I, was really say, I see a trophy sitting behind you. That Look is his that. actually. Yeah, that is his. <laughs> um, he was reserved saddle seat equitation. I mean, he became a great horse for us and we sold him to um, Jason Crone's clients bought him and they love him. And um, he's still there. I ask all the time, is he still for sale? Literally last week I might've asked him because we would buy him back probably. So he's been one of those horses. That special one. Yeah. So what would people be shocked to know about Julie Jan Daniels? I don't know. I'm pretty ordinary. Uh, I tried to think about this one over and over. I'm a shopaholic. I uh, love to shop. I love fashion, makeup. I am obsessed with makeup tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. But, you know, as a kid, I was a tomboy. And... Uh, I love to dress up. I don't get a chance to do it much. I did my hair for the first time in three months. Today. You look really <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that has to do with COVID, but uh, yeah, that's probably my, my hidden thing. That's your hidden thing. You know, I would have to say that being an outsider looking in at you, you appear, you don't have a lazy bone in your body. I, I mean, I've seen you taking pictures. You're, you're always messing in something. So when you're not doing the horse deal, what do you enjoy doing? Um, I have a lot of things that I actually love to do. Something else a lot of people don't know, I guess, about me is that when I broke my leg about three years ago, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And it took a really hard toll on me right after Youth Nationals that year. Um, to the point where I couldn't walk, I couldn't use my hands to brush my teeth. And um, so now I'm good. I'm on a good medication. Um, I've got a good support system as far as that goes. Quite a few people I didn't know had it have it. And so I look to the future now more um, because I don't know when it's going to become a problem for me. So I don't do the things I used to do. I used to jet ski all the time. I do it very seldomly now, probably because I don't live on a lake anymore, but those are the things I love to do. I love water. I love to dance. I love to do a lot of those things. I like to go out, socialize. I'm busy. Now the fatigue kind of hits me for, from the disease. So at three o'clock, if I don't have plans, I am in my house sitting down doing nothing. Please, I'm not a yeah. couch potato and it's really hard adjustment for me. It's been really yeah. hard. Um, so that's my, the hardest thing now is I, I, if I don't stay busy, uh, the fatigue kind of gets to me and I'm sitting doing nothing and drives me crazy. Yeah. Okay. I always see you doing little projects. It yeah. looks like you're, you know, you're showing befores and afters on yeah. like home decor and, yep. and you do a great job at it. Yeah. Those are the things I'd like to do. If I, you said, uh, there's a question somewhere. Your perfect day. That's my next question. My, What's your perfect day? I don't know. <laughs> I tried to figure that out. My perfect day would be, I don't know. I guess it's definitely the day that the, all the horses work great. There's no soundest issues. Kids ride great. Uh, that's always a perfect day. I want to say it's like relaxing on the beach or something, but if I'm on a vacation, I am that guilty horse trainer. All I do is think about what's happening at my barn. So that's bad. Um, I, yes, I like to DIY. So <laughs> in another life, I would, that's a question I think, in another life is um, I would flip houses and uh, I don't know. I, I definitely would probably do that. Marketing. I would have gotten into marketing if I never was a horse person. I think that would be my other thing. I love to do that kind of stuff. I am coming up with things to do all the time. I was going to say, you're always in dabbling in something. Like I said, I've seen <laughs> you with a camera. I've seen <laughs> you doing your social media yeah. website stuff. You got, you got your hands into it. At all. There's not a lazy bone in Julie Daniel's body. That's for for sure. I, I need to learn that. to slow down. They tell me that's going to catch up to me with this uh, extra thing in my life. But 
right now I, I don't feel like I need to, so I try not to. <laughs> so you try not to. Well, in closing, if you were to foresee in five years from now, or what is your hopes? Where is Julie Daniels uh, with your lesson program, your training operation? Where yeah. do you hope to be in five years? So knock on wood that I still feel comfortable to ride horses and I don't get that bad with this. Um, I would love for my lesson program to probably triple, maybe four times in size to the point where that would actually be my retirement plan. Um, so that's supporting me and I would just supervise it. I would have three, four lesson people and I would run that program. That program would facilitate my training program and the day that I can't do that or I'm tired of it or whatever, um, I would probably hand it down to Casey. She's been with me for 12, 13 years maybe now. That's a um, long time and, in this industry. Yep. <laughs> Good kid. Um, she, you know, she does a great job. And I think that, you know, she could become the trainer of Daniel Training Center. And I would just kind of oversee it. I don't think that's in five years, but that's our goal is so that when that time comes, that's that lesson program is paying for itself. It's, you know, paid for the business and then it's pushing more and more people into our industry. And then the training horses go from there. I, I can say that my, my program is not, um, I don't get a whole lot of people that come from other trainers. Um, my program for years has been built off what I've built in the lesson program. I'd say 80 for 85 percent of my training program is people that have come up in my lesson program one way or another that's uh you can be proud of that because it's yeah. it's easy for people to jump from one bar to sure. another but it's not easy to start them and get right. them to that point so right. it's obviously it's been an odd year for everybody every everything's such a big question mark uh what do you guys got upcoming or where you, I know you're planning on going to youth. Do you have anything you're going to try to do before youth or? No, we, we were hoping for region eight and it got moved to August. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure if the California regionals are going to happen, but we made the decision to, because youth is a lot longer in July and we are taking three or four kids that have never shown at that big of a show yet. Plus we're taking uh, three of the experienced rider kids to youth, we've decided that June is just going to be a boot camp. We're just going to get everybody as prepared as possible um, and and go to youth in July. That's kind of our plan. Um, we do a couple fun things here and there. We all went kayaking the other day as a as a farm. I saw like that. <laughs> we have a big yeah. birthday party here tomorrow on Sunday for one of, one of the kids because they've all kind of been quarantined together here. So. Um, but that's our focus is, is youth. We're taking 17 horses and, um, Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's busy. It's busy. That's busy. Yeah. Wow. So, um, we're excited. We're, we're excited for the brand new, our Academy kids are the ones that are going to go do the experience classes and, um, we're happy for them and we can't wait to go. So this month is going to be a lot of training and some of the kids are, doing some sponsorships and trying to raise money for to go and things like that. So we'll work on some things like that with them. Um, and that's about it. Well, awesome. Well, thank you, Julie, for taking the time today to visit with us. And I know I'll for sure see you at youth.